Hi everyone. Good afternoon from Barcelona. Um, welcome to, to a new Rhino user webinar. This is Pedro Cortez here. And uh, yeah, we continue with this series of videos where we are discovering what well, new workflows in which uh, Rhino is involved. Uh, today, Alfredo Chavez will explore how Rhino and Grasshopper can take advantage of uh, Houdini solvers. Uh, trying to generate uh, physics based aggregations of complex uh, bubbles. The, uh, the workflow will leverage the ease of modeling in Rhino, the simulation power of Houdini, and the interoperability capabilities of Grasshopper, taking advantage of uh, the best of each uh, work. Alfredo is an architect and computational designer. He is uh, currently part of Heatherwick Studio. And uh, his approach focuses on blending technologies from different fields and uh, exploring their application to the AEC industry. So I let them uh, start presenting, and I'll be here as always in the shadows, collecting uh, questions you might have for, for him in the in the end of the webinar. Okay. So Alfredo, when you want. Yep. Thanks, Pedro, for the intro. Just let me quickly share my screen. Just please let me know if. If everyone just can see it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, cool. OK. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Alfredo Chavez, as is Pedro uh, just said. Um, I'm an architect uh, by training computational designer at Hedwig Studio, uh, where I work across several projects, um, different scales and stages. Um, on top of that, I'm part of the uh, applied research team at the studio, uh, which is called G-Code. Um, uh, so today we, I would like to introduce you some of the workflows that we've been developing on the studio uh, that take advantage of uh, how to use different softwares for the, the, the tool for the job, basically, how to use the best tool for the job. Um, in this case, we will use uh, Rhino, Grasshopper, and Houdini. Uh, but before all of that, uh, I would like to introduce you to why uh, these workflows are important for us. So please just follow me down this rabbit hole. So as studio, we have a diverse portfolio, as I mentioned. So we have like different scales of projects, different uh, type typologies, uh, not just architecture. We do vehicles. We do uh, from museums, art, bridges, uh, transport, uh, perfume bottles, uh, kind of all sort of the of design. Uh, we focus in creating human experiences and places that connect people and, and create emotional engagement. Um, so our studio is this that you can see in the image. What was this uh, now just moving? Um, we are 200 people um, and we are totally into anything 3D. Uh, so we always design around like with people in mind and around crafting uh, ideas representing this. And we've been always used to work with novel fabrication techniques and methods that can allow us to just get the most out of different materials. So we like to try different materials and how to just blend them, how to play with them to achieve new shapes and, and uses. So we develop our own tools, then uh, physically and digitally, and uh, to develop these kind of novel shapes and, and use of materials. Uh, our models not always can be replicated in real life uh, because the workshop has a specific dimension and scale. So uh, we need to jump into the 3D world and the computer edit software um, where, where we just need to model things uh, in some way of accurate physics because we don't model just with the traditional approach of just modeling. We would like to simulate some physics on our, on our shapes and take advantage of different materials, constraints. Um, so for that, we just use uh, finite element softwares and we also use some other softwares, as in this case is Houdini, to simulate some sort of behavior, uh, physical behavior on, on the elements. Uh, so one way to overcome the size of our workshop is just to jump into 3D um, and incorporate these 3D tools and elements into our pipeline and our workflows um, to be able to see how things will get manufactured, how, which kind of constraints we're playing with, if this is an extrusion through a, through a, a specific shape, with hole with a specific, a specific shape, uh, how it will react if it's metal, if it's a, another kind of alloy. Um, so we are really into these kind of things. Uh, we love to just like go from the physical to the digital some most of the time. 
So we can model something 3D, manufacturing to, like in the workshop, simulate some things in the workshop, like real life stuff, and then just go back to the computer with those results, either, either if it's like 3D scan or any other technique, and, and just see the results there. So today, the workflow that we're going to follow is roughly what you can see in the screen at the moment. So we're going to use Rhino to just model some shapes, uh, some blocks in this case. We're just going to export them as an OBJ into Houdini, where we will simulate the physics between those and how those collide. Uh, from Houdini, we'll export not just a mesh uh, or a damp geometry. We will take advantage of JSON and, and build a deserializer to be able to deconstruct just the transforms of those points through Grasshopper and reinstantiate those blocks into Rhino. So I hope that's clear. Um, with no further ado, let's just jump into it. Right, what well, you can see in the screen right now, it's um, my Rhino and Grasshopper viewports um, using Rhino 8, just for the sake of clarity. Uh, just because I, I like how they implementing the new blocks natively into it. So I'm not using any third party elements other than this one, that it's just like um, a dot text that we can even script on our own. So we could do everything with vanilla grasshopper components, let's say. Um, let's actually close grasshopper for, this, for the time beam. And let's just open the block manager on my file. Uh, well, actually, let's insert a block. It's easier. So you see that we have two different blocks here that I already um, created. So you don't need to worry about just, I don't want to spend time creating like a dump, like easy to, to model uh, shapes. So in this case, let's go with the cross. And, and I've got my cross in the zero, 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 like that. Um, so once I model that, I literally just like export it as, a, as an OBJ that you just can pick from the list. And once you've got that exported that I already did, you will be able to see it here that it created. I mean, MTL file with the materials and it creates a, the OBJ as a mesh, right? So once you've got that, so once you model your shape into Rhino, and now it's time to just jump into Houdini. Um, for those of you that don't know Houdini, Houdini is just like a BFX uh, software that was developed by SideFX. And it's got really powerful, it's multi-threaded, which is really important. It's got a really powerful engine uh, to simulate physics and, and well, different other behaviors. And it's used, um, Mostly in BFX movies, uh, films, uh, um, TV shows, and so on, uh, advertisement to generate like fluid movements, shapes, crowds, similar to like any other BFX software out there. In this case, I'm using it just to generate the physics simulation that we will bring back into Rhino through Grasshopper. So, as you can see, the interface is not too different from, from that in, in Rhino and Grasshopper. So you have a viewport here. You've got like your node graph here, which is similar to what you can see in Grasshopper. But the difference also between this and Grasshopper is that every single node has got a different set of properties and attributes that you can change on the fly. So you see that this node, for example, is just creating a box. Um, but you can see that all these information here just belong to that specific node. So each node is extremely parametric in a way. So each node is extremely uh, versatile and you can just adjust a thousand things. So I'm just going to run you quickly through what the script does. And then we're just going to import our geometry from Rhino that we just generated, that block with the cross um, shape. Um, so basically, the Houdini, it's in this file, you can see that I've got like a group here that is called collisions. So in this group here, if I just go one by one, I'm basically generating and deforming uh, the different shapes that I will use as a boundary boxes. 
same here, same here. And you can see that once I just merge all together, you've got my boundary surfaces plus the floor that we will see later. Right? Then I've got a box that is that one in gray that you can see in the screen that I am basically creating some points to instance my geometry inside of it. And the geometry that I'm instancing is, is this box that I scale and I'll just instance to those positions. So as you can see, it's a little bit different from Grasshopper because Grasshopper has got a logic that goes from left to right, where the Houdini's got a logic that goes from top to bottom. So once we've got that, I'm using a box just for the sake of clarity, but then we will just like using advantage of the procedural workflow, we will change that shape for our shape and it will work. We just need to rerun the simulation and it will work as nicely as with the blocks. So once I've got these blocks here, I assemble them, which is something similar to make them block instances. And I just write some little BEX code, which is like a BEX is a code specific to Houdini, but in this case, I'm just doing this to keep track of the name of the, of the actual blocks. And then this is where it gets interesting. This note that you guys see that is called .NET, that's where the real physics simulation happens. So in this case, if I activate it, you can see how I hover over the, the node and you can see activate this like view, visibility is on. You can bypass the node, which will just basically make the node a pass-through node where it won't affect anything. That's actually a really nice functionality. And this is like a ghosted way to see the node. So once you get in this node, you see all these parameters here that I've got at the bottom. I'm just going to make this a little bit bigger. You see all these parameters here that says simulation, right? So the interesting bit about this .NET, which is a, like a rigid body simulator, um, a solver, rigid body solver, it's called, is that you can dive in and you can now set see everything that is going on in there. So you see two main, this node graph, which can be a little bit confusing if you never work with Houdini. But just to try to simplify this, I'll, I'll explain it in the following way. So you've got all these nodes in the left-hand side, which are all the physics colliders. So those are all the things that are your bounding box, your ground plane, the little sphere, the form sphere that we've got in the center that we can use to just like, uh, interest, uh, like uh, collide with. And in your right-hand side with all this set of nodes, we've got our particles, let's say our, our block instances that are going to be the ones activating, deactivating our rigid bodies. And then we've got our sub solver, which this node, you can even dig into this one as well. And this is basically this, this node is controlling all the spawning of these shapes. So as you can see, once I start simulating, this node will be really important because it will, once you drop all these 50 um, primitives, let's say, it will generate another set of 50 primitives and keep dropping them on top of each other. I'm just adding then the force here, which is a gravity. And then I'm just merging everything together to get the final output. That is what you can see here. So if I just simulate this guy, you can see how now we're just dropping a bunch of cubes in this case, using the ground plane as well. Uh, so it's, it's zero, almost real time. You see your set of bounding boxes to make the, the boundary collider. And you can see how things are reacting uh, with one another, another, right? And and with all of that, the simulation bit would be complete. What is really interesting now is that once you've got all your simulation complete with all your packed primitives, with all your block instances, we can unpack that simulation. And we can just go back. It's like exploding the blocks and reading again the names that I created with the BEX node. So you can read all of them. And if I just rerun this in front of you just to say, now it's going way faster because it's already calculated. You can see how things are getting red, things are getting black. That means that I am deactivating them just for the sake of computer resources. But you can actually have all of them on all the time, which will be way more accurate, but it will take way more time, right? So I'm saying like drop the red, the red is active, then deactivate it, drop the next red like that. And now is when the interesting bit happens as well is that instead of just, I could just perfectly be able to just like push this as a geometry, as a mesh and be done with it, right? 
But that couldn't be that interesting from the point of view of manufacturing, which is what we are interested in. I would like to keep track of the batch that the block was produced, when the block was dropped, uh, which number of the piece each is each one to see how far off from the starting point it, it fold and it got frozen in time. These kind of things that you couldn't do if I just bring everything as a damn mesh directly from Houdini into Rhino. So to do that, what I'm doing is like, what if I can extract just the transforms of these guys and write them into a JSON file that I can just read from almost real life as well in, in Grasshopper and reinstantiate the blocks, which is super quick to do uh, in Grasshopper and just have my final shape in Rhino with all the information that I'm just passing through uh, Houdini without losing anything. So to do that, I just unpack. So I kind of like explode those blocks and I pick the parameters because in Houdini it's really important that you see that everything has parameters in Houdini and you need or attributes and you need to just be really careful of the attributes that you pass through. So let's say in, in Grasshopper, you need to be really cautious with the way that you manage your trees and how your branches meet each other and so on. In Houdini, you need to be really careful with the, the way you play with the attributes and which kind of attributes you're passing through, which kind of attributes you're transferring or promoting, and so on and so forth. So to do that, I've got this extract transform right here that this node, what it does is this, it writes a transform file. So if I just remove this pass through, I'll see that this transform gets written into my hard drive. So let's just, I've done that already. But let's just simulate that we are in step 600, let's say, which is this one. And I want to know, I just want to write that file, right? So in that case, your file, let me just get rid of this in Rhino. Your file will look like something like this. You see it right now is a little bit messy because you cannot really keep track of what's going on. The JSON is not really, um, it's quite structured, but you need to, know what you're looking at, right? So to do that easier, I just went into an online JSON viewer that everyone can go and is, is free to use. So you can just like see what's going on in your JSON. So as you can see, my JSON has got this structure right now. And I'm basically interested on my positions that I'm just writing in the JSON file and my orients, right? Which is basically a transform. Both of them will, will give me the transform of those points. So you can see how here we've got P. P is positions, right? And if I extend this branch called 7 and this branch called 5, you'll see that every single instance is got an X, Y, Z. And I will have one of these guys for every single piece that I simulated. X, Y, Z for all of them, right? And what about the Orient? So the Orient, if I just search for the name, name is Orient, this is a name, name of the piece. That's the Orient. So the Orient, again, what if we go, sorry, what if we go to seven, which is at values and five, and you'll have a set of four values this time. For those of you that are not familiar with um, game engines, for example, or VFX software, uh, they tend to use not Euclidean rotations, but they tend to use um, oh, Euler rotations, sorry, but they tend to use uh, something called uh, quaternions. And quaternions are like a mathematical representation with four numbers of any rotation in space. Uh, so it's they use that just because it's, Slightly, it's actually more accurate than the X, Y, Z rotations for complex simulations and so on. So it can this this in this way, you can actually read these positions and rotations uh, if you know how to access them within your, your JSON file, right? And how to match the trees. So once we've seen where these things live in the JSON file. You've got this JSON file that was written from Houdini into my 
whatever location in your computer. And now let's ju jump back into Grasshopper and Rhino. So in Grasshopper and Rhino, I just got this quick definition that I can share with all of you at the end of the session. I think Pedro is, is going to send all of you in, or you can send an email, or we can set up a drive. And I, I will attach this and the transform file so you can just play with it and can just give it a go and, um, and try to understand everything that's going on. Uh, but mainly, what I want to do is like I'm using Rhino 8 right now, as I mentioned, just for this, mainly for these two blocks, uh, comp for the two components, which are like the block instances components. And the, because this node is way nicer. If you guys use Rhino 7 or Python, you realize how kind of like the interface is quite clunky in the Python node or the C sharp node, the basic ones. But now for for the interface of Python 3 of the new code editor, they actually improve it quite a lot. Um, so I'm going to go through these like in both ways. I'm just going to use the C sharp node. And I'm just going to also use the, let me just bring it from the other screen. I'm going to also just show you how to use the old Python reading your code from Visual Studio Code. So in this component here in, in, in Python, it's got two inputs, as you can see. One is the file path, which is the, uh, the JSON file that we just created through Houdini. And one is the attribute name, which is the, it's asking us for the name of the attributes that we want to read from. We want to read the attribute orient and the attribute P, as I mentioned before. So if I go here, you see that the attribute, attribute P is the name of that attribute, X, Y, Z. And the attribute orient is the other one that we are interested in. You need to match like capital letters and so on just to for it to be able to work. So you see, orient is all lowercase and p is uppercase. So what's going on inside this node? I explained it to you, I think, from Visual Studio just because of the coloring. Um, and I can have it like full screen. And I've got it open here. So what's going on into Visual Studio? Uh, into that Python node is I created basically a deserializer of JSON specific for that, for this workflow. So that means I tried to use um, JSON from Andrew Human as well, but uh, it doesn't, the hierarchy of the JSON is too complex and it just basically wasn't giving me the desired results. So I ended up writing my own deserializer for JSON specifically for this, to read the point attributes from a JSON file generated on Houdini, which was a really specific, as you saw, a really specific way to write these, these JSON files. So how, how do we do that? So I basically in this file, I'm just going to quickly run through the main blocks of it. And I'm going to also attach this file to the final uh, email that Pedro is going to send in like 20, 30 minutes when we finish the session uh, after the round of questions. and. So you can just look at it like properly, take some time, just read it through it, understand everything that's going on. So uh, basically what I'm doing is I'm creating, first of all, uh, a class to represent geometric data. If you are familiar with bringing geometry from Houdini to Rhino already, you can understand some of the nomenclature that I'm using here just because there's a plugin also you can use that is called HO. Or yeah, I think it's called Ho, like hey, Houdini GH, Ho GH. Uh, that basically I, I follow the same naming conventions as they use uh, for the sake of clarity as well. Um, but I readapt all my code to be way simpler as well. So I, I do everything, all this serializing process in 113 lines of code. And it can be even further simplified, to be honest. So I'm defining a class called a main class to hold the geometric data of the actual geometry that's coming from, from Houdini. And I'm basically mainly interested on the list of point attributes, right? So once you load the that class, you have a function called load JSON that it will just basically read all your JSON file. And it will convert it to uh, a dictionary as well to so, so we can sort by value and keys. And we load the attributes and generate the data. That means load attributes is here, engine data is here. So I'm just basically calling these two other functions from within this one. Uh, we load the attributes uh, into a, 
uh, a list uh, called attributes, and then we basically saw those attributes and append them to the end of it. And then for generating the grasshopper data, we call this function called gen attribute data, which is part of this second class called attribute that is here. Main points that I'd like to highlight, again, you're going to have received this file, so you're going to be able to just see it through properly. Main thing I would like to highlight is that for these two values, as you can see, 174, 175, these are hard coded because it's if we go back into this, you can see how 17, sorry, 175, it's for the orient. Yeah, so you can see how it's just like one, seven, five, and that's accessing my list of values. And one, seven, four, as we can see here, it's, let me just go back to Visual Studio, is the type, the data type. So you've got the data values and the data type. So if I go, just go back to my JSON, four is tuples, it's, one, seven, uh, yes, tuples, and then you've got values in one, seven, five. Basically, that's that's how I am hard coding, hard coding those two specific locations within my JSON to read values and types from. I am also separating them by numeric values and string values uh, because they have different structures within the JSON. And then at the end, I'm just generating all the grasshopper data following the grasshopper data tree logic that you can just use from, from the kernel data and grasshopper. You can actually access and just manage your trees from within Python. And you can just basically set up your list of lists into data trees properly and cleanly from within Python. Um, so basically, this is actually what's going on after we just get rid of all the classes and so on that we just, let's say that we take them from, from granted, you basically are reading a, a file path that we're just giving, which is the, the location of the JSON file. We're loading the JSON file, creating our class hgeo, uh, loading the JSON from hgeo. So it's the function that I explained at the beginning. And then just writing all the attributes into its point attribute list kind of, um, like into its uh, main value holder, its container. This, so for example, for the ads, and then for, for ads, attributing attributes, if the attribute name is equal to the attribute name, so it's for example, if that attribute name is equal to whatever is coming from this input, then generate the grasshopper data, right? I think it may seem a little bit convoluted right now, but it will make sense uh, once you receive the file and you have the time just to go through it properly. And this is basically what I'm getting. I'm getting a list of four of seven values. So four of them belong to the orient and three belongs to the positions. So you have orient one, orient two, orient three, orient four, or quaternion one, quaternion two, quaternion three, quaternion four, and then you've got X, Y, Z, right? So what I'm doing here is just I've got a list item component that I just basically explode their outputs and I'm connecting them to quaternion one, two, three, four, X, Y, Z into my C sharp node. And this C sharp node will be pretty straightforward to explain. The C sharp node basically creates a quaternion from, from those input values. As you can see, Q1 and Q4 are swapped. So it's Q4, Q1, Q2, Q3. And this is mainly because all the VFX for software, or at least Houdini, same as Blender as well, they use Y up axis, whether Rhino uses Z up axis. And this affects the quaternion display that we're just trying to replicate in here. So for us to have the exact matching view in Rhino and Houdini, that's why I'm basically tweaking that. Then I'm just getting constructing a plane and, and saying basically if if there's actually a quaternion, just generate a plane, um ex extract that into the basically into that plane. 
Uh, and then I'm setting the base point of the element in exactly in the right location with X, Y, Z. And just setting those plane origins into those positions. So you have the plane oriented properly in the right position as well. And then at the end, I'm just basically performing a general rotation. So everything that is standing in your Y axis kind of like rotates into your Z axis. And that's basically it for the C-sharp node. And after that, I'm just basically fetching those into the new uh, block instance component. I'm just checking that the block instance is in the cube. So if I actually select this guy, what I'm just simply doing is just picking out the box instead of the cross. Uh, if I just go into one, you see how that's the cross. So it, and the, the position and the value of the instance change to the new different block. And I'm basically coloring everything using this color. But up to this point, you cannot see any advantage of following this workflow versus following a workflow in which you keep track of every single element. But what if I just want to read also the name? Uh, in this case, I'm using a different approach. It's the same code, exactly the same code as I've written in, in here. But this is actually reading. If you create a Python node, in case that you didn't know this, and you go like, show, uh, 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 it's got something like show code input parameter. You can actually read the total file from your desktop, plug it in, and this node will just read the code from that file. So you can just write your code in Visual Studio Code right now and just, just plugging it in into your Python node. So if I open this node, it will basically see the node is basically fetching all the data from synchro synchronize all the data from the file in my desktop. And I'm just reading the name attribute this time. What's coming out of there? So that's interesting because it's I've got uh, the name of every single piece by batch. So you can see the batch is like the first number, 0, 1, 2, 3. And then you have the piece number of every single piece that was generated in that batch. And what if I want to color the batches, color the pieces by batch? There we go. So you can see that the black batch, the black pieces are the ones that were generated first. Then it turned into red, batch number two. Then it turned into white, into yellow, batch number three. And then it turns into white, batch number four. And what if I can go the extra step and generate the annotation for it? So you can also annotate the every single piece, basically. So if I switch this guy off, you see that I've got a three-dimensional annotation map of every single piece in every single location once it's aggregated. Right? That's actually really cool in terms of manufacturing as well, in terms of how, when, and, and to drop the piece, uh, how, what process to follow. Maybe this is not the best approach. Maybe we need to just change it and drop it from a different location. Right? So I think this is actually part of the workflow I want to show you today. Uh, we can go back into any of the related questions on, on the Visual Studio Code or the Houdini side of things. I'll try to rush and go a little bit quicker so we have a little more time before questions, as I'm I'm sure that you have you guys have questions and and I can just hopefully respond to all of them. And I can just also share the files at the end of the session for all of you to see. Um, again, let's actually do one final test just to kind of uh, aggregate all the ideas we, we talked through today. So what if I want to simulate, not just that, but let me just get rid of these guys. What if I want to simulate all the crosses now? All right, so let's open Houdini. And let's plug our pieces exported as OBJ instead of our blocks. And let's recompute, you see? You've got now all the crosses, which is a little bit more interesting than the blocks. And what if we play the simulation? You'll see how they will start like falling and just colliding with each other. Um, they will get frozen in time at some point because, again, 
that's just for computational uh, to save some computational resources, but you can leave all of them activated active at once. So let's see, let's let's keep it running for a little bit longer because at the moment it's calculating on the fly. Um, as I updated all the geometry, and this is actually five times more complex because it's got five times the number of faces that the box had. That's why it's taking a little bit longer. So if you can see now, I think we can just let's let's leave it running till the six hundred frame, and you'll see it once it gets to the end, it will restart and it will make it way way quicker. You'll see the animation almost real time, even slightly faster than than, real, than how these things will drop. Right, so there you go. You can see now how things are like clashing and just colliding and just falling in place. And what if we just like let's stop the simulation, go to frame six hundred, and let's let's actually let me close my transform JSON here, and let me close my Houdini here, and Visual Studio all together, and let's activate this guy and see what's going on. So now you can just see how my transform file has been written with today's right now, basically today's date and, and right now. And now we can just go back into Grasshopper. And we can you can see how you can see already how this has been updated. So because the, the boxes are clashing and just intersecting with each other, which that shouldn't happen, is because we need to update our blocks to the new shape. And you see how now this is exactly what we want it. This is exactly what we were after. This is the pieces are basically on top of each other, not intersecting, just real physics simulated. That's how they would fall. And you can also keep track of each piece. And, and you can also pass a bunch of different attributes into them, not just positions or orients. Uh, I'm just coloring them because I thought it was easier to explain, but you can just imagine how these can be extended. Um, so yeah, that's basically what I wanted to talk about today. Um, again, I'll send the files, uh, with, uh, Pedro later after today's, uh, quick workshop. Um, um, please feel free just to ask any, any questions. I'm, I'm more than happy to, to answer them. Thank you very much, Alfredo, for your presentation and, and for the amazing work behind it. So yeah, we have a couple of questions from the audience. So yep. I'll start reading. Uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, how long have you been using Houdini and Grasshopper? This question is from Leo, Sue. Yeah, hi Leo. So uh, Grasshopper, I've been a Grasshopper user since 2013, I would say. So like, sorry, 10 years now, I would say. And, and Houdini, I just been actually learning on my own um, in the past, I would say couple of years, uh, three years, but I'm really far in, in Houdini, I'm really far from from being an expert at all. Um, I think it's, it's more about finding the right tool for the job. And that's what, in this case, Houdini was that tool. Um, so um, I drill all the rigid body and all the things that I could find, and I just study all of that. But it's, it's, so, it's such a wide software that same as Grasshopper as well on, on Rhino. So it's such a wide software as well that you can be really, you can really drill it into specific areas. But yeah, I would say Grasshopper was 10 years and Rhino 10, 12 years. Um, and for Houdini, I would say two, three years. Yeah, the next one is really is related to what you've uh, been talking about now. Uh, What's the main advantage of using Houdini? In case we perform the collision simulation in Kangaroo, for example, yeah. uh, what uh, what do we would lose? Uh, like it uh, eighty times uh, slower or three times more precise? Yeah, that's actually a really good question. I at the beginning we tried to uh, live within Rhino because Rhino is our main tool in the studio and and we were comfortable with it and Grasshopper. But then we found that uh, Kangaroo is not just for the speed, speed-wise, Houdini is multi-threaded, so it's, it's definitely going to be way faster. 
uh, but for these kind of simulations. But it wasn't just that. It's about, let me actually just bring out Houdini quickly. Bypass this note again. And let me just go to the section where I simulate these guys. We found it really difficult, for example, to simulate bodies like, like these ones uh, accurately. Because these, these are concave geometries that if you want to generate physics simulation of concave, concave geometries, uh, Kangaroo doesn't allow you. He, Kangaroo uses a method called convex hull, uh, which is this guy here, that in convex hull, in, in, it creates in, in Kangaroo, it creates some kind of a convex approximation, so some kind of like pyramid. So it would be, if I change this guy to more like that, this, by the way, this, this thing that you're seeing in blue right now is the, is the collider geometry. So it's not the actual geometry, it's just what Houdini is interpreting as the colliding shape. So if you have concave shapes intersecting with each other, uh, you cannot simulate that accurately in Kangaroo. Kangaroo is really good if you have something like spheres colliding, you know? Or it, it could be like faster in Houdini to simulate, but you can simulate that accurately, let's say in Kangaroo. But in, Houdini allows you to just like go beyond that and have concave shapes. Uh, and in this case, it was really important um, for us um, to be accurate in terms of how our physics and how our colliders were uh, created. Really powerful. Uh, so um, Amy wants to know if uh, the simulation requires some inputs for, for the object weight and gravity in order to run. Yeah, yeah, indeed. It just, uh, your readable dissolver basically takes care of like tolerance. Uh, basically, this solver is actually simulating a, a bullet. It's called the bullet solver. Um, so it actually, can, you can input different um, physics constraints and different like gravity and forces. That, the same as you can actually, you can use your gravity as you can see is 9.8. Uh, which is real world gravity, but you can crank that up. You can you can you can play with the physics values of each material. If that's the question, yes. And with the elasticity of, if you're simulating a cloth, you can uh, you will use a different node, which is a balloon, for example, balloon simula uh, balloon solver, and that will require you to just uh, give inputs as elasticity, uh, how how bounce, how bouncy it is. Same in here, how bouncy the rigid body is, and so on. They are all different parameters that you can actually uh, input. And just play with. Okay, another one from Robert Stapala. Uh, what other interesting simulations we can do by this interpolation of software? Can you come again, please, Pedro? Yeah, what other uh, simulations that you can do using Houdini and Grasshopper? Yes, I, for example, you see, if you not worry about just uh, pushing meshes into one another, for example, the crinkle example that I show in my presentation, PowerPoint presentation before, it can be a really nice example of something you can do in, in Grasshopper and, and simulate in both. So you can just basically, let's say you, you have a parametric roll, roller in Grasshopper that you create and you import the roller into Houdini and roll different surfaces and see the different patterns that come the other, the other side. Um, and that's basically using another physics solver that you couldn't achieve in just by using only Grasshopper. So do you have any resources that show use cases in architecture? Use cases as in uh, re learning resources or use cases in architecture of Houdini? Uh, both, I think. I, I, th I think that I think that I haven't seen, and I've been in a bunch of conferences over the past couple of years, and I haven't seen anyone using Houdini for real practice stuff because everyone kind of goes into finite elements, but for early stages, that's probably an overkill, right? So we love to to use this kind of, uh, of like blending this kind of technologies from different fields uh, to to be able to just design. We mostly are design led practice, so it's also really good to have designer friendly tools that don't require you to jump right into the finite elements sim simulation or engineering um, software and can give you really quick and interactive um, simulations that you can just connect with your main CAD software, which in this case is Rhino. Okay. 
Any initial thoughts on material selections for the blocks for this method? Uh, for material selection for, for the blocks of this method, I think we were using a uh, laser cut um, MDF in the in the workshop, and we use also 3D printed rubber, uh, like the the PLA that is uh, is flexible. We use that one as well. So I think it's kind of like mainly I would say that I've seen it tested with MDF most of the time with these cruciform shapes and with more complex shapes as well. Um, so, because it's the, it's the quickest to prototype, I would say, because 3D printing takes a lot of time. Um, and maybe it's easy, something that you can assemble together on site. And if you actually see the ICD pavilion that they, it's called ICD aggregation pavilion, I think, if I'm not mistaken, that they did a few years ago, they used finite elements to calculate that one. And it was an installation and we used Deus robots to, to drop the actual pieces that were made out of plastic, if I'm not wrong. And they, um, which is funny is that we got extremely similar results to what they were doing with finite element systems just by simulating it in, in Houdini, which is, was like something that was really unexpected from, unexpected from us. Good. Looking for more questions. Um, so would you be able to bring the whole animation uh, for all your blocks in Rhino? Yes, I mean, you could just bring it not as a Rhino doesn't support if I just, Pedro, just correct me if I'm wrong. Does it support OBG sequence right now? I don't think so. Yeah, I think because it means it, Rhino doesn't have a, it's not in, intended for do animation. So it doesn't have a support for like a proper timeline. Yeah. Although I think you can script something with a slider, right? You can actually animate the, the slider yeah. and, and say that you can import a, new frames in every slider. Yeah, um, like, like the different the different positions in in one animation. Exactly. For example, ten or, or twenty positions. Exactly. Yeah, and and you could actually animate this slider, and you can uh, export an animation right from from Rhino. Okay. Did you look at uh, FlexHopper to run the simulation? If yes, no. why did you decide against using it? Okay. Mm -hmm. No. Actually, that's a really good one. I'll I'll take note of that one. Okay, let's hopper. Thanks, Raul Das. And uh, well, I think this is all for today. Any more questions? We have like 10, 10 more, more minutes. Yes, Amy wants to know if uh, can if you can reorient your location in the simulation space. Can a camera perspective be set? A camera perspective just bringing it from Houdini into, into Rhino? So can you reorient your location in the simulation space? In the simulation space. Uh, or is this a question about the Y and Z axis? I'm not sure about that, the question right now. It's like Z, yeah. you could just reorient. And I think you can set up uh, Houdini actually to reorient the X and um, the, the, the y, y and Z. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could do that. And in terms of exporting a camera, from Houdini into Rhino, I actually didn't try, but I'm sure that you can just export camera and parameters of the camera into a JSON file as well. And you can probably, by scripting it, you can just regenerate a camera, a Rhino camera. Good the views match? I am not 100% sure. So as, as Houdini and, and OpenAPI? Uh, as what? An API. Houdini? Yeah. No, that I am aware they don't. It's actually, uh, Alex, that's actually a really good question because I, I think that actually maybe they have something. I just basically found way more interesting just to uh, script a couple of things on on like components of Grasshopper. Yeah, it's actually got an API, but I, it's got a Python API. Yeah. So you could actually just use the, the Python API even and try to have a plugin and connecting yeah. from Grasshopper connecting into it. Yeah, Alex, Alex Kim uh, wants to know as well is if it's possible to simulate cloth plastic inflatables in Houdini. I think yeah. you've already uh, answered this. 
Yes, that's that's all possible. You can create this actually really, really interesting tutorials of Houdini if you guys are interested on them. Uh, there's a guy, a guy called Entagma, uh, E-N-T-A-G-M-A. -A, and they do uh, quick tutorials, just Houdini. Um, and you can see how they do inflatables and how they do different kind of growing animations, inflatables, clothes, all of this. Um, so yeah, it's more interesting about how you could use the the output or the outcomes of those into Rhino in this case, right? How would you just push that into Rhino? Is it going to be like just as a mesh, or or you're going to basically send some constraints from Rhino as, a, for example, some kind of uh, window and is you model in Rhino in your building and you send it to Houdini, you simulate the curtain or some strings or something. And then just like, how are you going to bring it back just as a mesh? Is that good enough? Or maybe, because I, I don't know if there's a way that you can export a cloth simulation back into Rhino without being a mesh. Maybe you need to reconstruct and rebuild um, your geometry through Grasshopper. Okay. Good. Uh, I well, for all the audience, uh, this recording will be available in some days in, in our uh, YouTube list for random user webinars. So for those of you who missed the, um, uh, some part of the presentation, uh, you'll be able to, to watch the game, okay? And uh, well, uh, thank you very much, Alfredo. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all the audience, for, for being here. Thanks, and, everyone. Um, well, uh, let's see in future in future video, future performance. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Amazing work, Alfredo. Thank you. Thank you. Congrats. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Bye.